How many times have you heard in the last year that the science is settled or that anyone not going along with the medical authorities are ignorant science deniers? It's not apparent by those that make these claims that they are familiar with what science actually is. The word means the observation, identification, description, experimental investigation and theoretical explanation of phenomena and a systematic method or body of knowledge in a given area. Science is a process and a tool that our logical minds can use. It is not wisdom and it is not a system that tells us what to do or how to orientate ourselves in this universe. Unfortunately, the term has been increasingly misused by authorities and their devotees. And when they say science, they usually mean dogma. Dogma that they want enforced with censorship of those who take a different point of view. But what exactly are they afraid of? Then there's the current controversy that started certainly in the, in the mid 1980s. You can give a date to it, uh, April 23rd, 1984. And since then, you, science died. It died in the 1980s and that free and open discourse and debate was killed in academic, in the academic world and in the professional scientific world. And now we have dogma. And that's where the authorities or the people high up decide what is true what cannot be debated, uh, discussed, argued against. And if you bring up arguments that go against that dogma, then it, that's the controversy. As illustrations for the theme of this video, I'd like to use examples of individuals who, while pursuing science, have clashed with dogma. The first is the inventor of the polymerase chain reaction, Carrie Mullis. In 1988, Mullis was working on developing analytic routines for nucleic acid detection. He was asked to write a report about the progress on the project, which was supported by the National Institutes of Health. After he had written, HIV is the probable cause of AIDS, in his report, he paused and realised that he better check for a scientific reference to support the statement. Now this is something I have become familiar with when investigating alleged viral diseases. Other doctors and publications seem to take it for granted that it's all been established in the science and there's no need to check up on how these so-called facts were verified. Early 2020 was a wake-up call for me in this regard as I realised much of what we were taught as doctors was not science but dogma. Within six months of this realisation I joined the Virus Mania team and co-authored the third edition of the book. Since then, I have taken no medical claims at face value and scratched deep beneath the surface to track down and look at the original documents myself. And every one of these journeys not only contributes to my own knowledge and sometimes wisdom, but also builds understanding about how dogma is created. True scientists like Harry Mullis showed us why it was unwise to accept claims at face value, even if all of your colleagues seem to be going along with it. He tells a story about how his personal investigations into the claim that HIV causes AIDS began. I was just a, a, a consultant there. I came in about three days a month and we were working on that. And at some point we needed to re-up our, our grant from the NIH to work on that. And I had to write it. And so the first line of that was HIV is the probable cause of AIDS. And I wrote that and then I said, well, I need a paper some kind of scientific paper to reference that statement because when you make a scientific a statement like that that's like a fact so you need to say here's how come i know that right you put a little one if it's the first statement you've made and then you put down at the bottom of the paper you have a one and you say here's a paper by somebody that describes why that statement is true right and so i said to, i said well what's that i don't know let me think about it. what is that paper who do i go to for that and I looked around, I asked a couple of virologists at that company, and they said, no, you don't have to reference that. I said, I have to reference that, because I, I don't know where that came from. How do I know that? And it turned out that nobody knew it. Mullis continued to tell a story in the foreword for Peter Duisberg's Inventing the AIDS Virus, written in 1993. After 10 or 15 meetings over a couple of years, I was getting pretty upset when no one would cite the reference. 
Finally, I had an opportunity to question one of the giants in HIV and AIDS research, Dr. Luke Montagnier of the Pasteur Institute, when he gave a talk in San Diego. So I asked him. With a look of condescending puzzlement, Montagnier said, why don't you quote the report from the Centers for Disease Control? I replied, it doesn't really address the issue of whether or not HIV is the probable cause of AIDS, does it? Mullis continued to press him and cut straight to the point, saying to Montagnier, I'm looking for the original paper where somebody showed that HIV caused AIDS. This time, Dr. Montagnier's response was to walk quickly away to greet an acquaintance across the room. You can tell the difference between scientists and, and engineers. When an engineer fails, the planes don't fly, or the bridge collapses, or the radios don't work. I mean, it's easy. You don't have to be an expert. It's very difficult to uh, know when a scientist is right, a scientific theory is right. Even for us scientists ourselves, it's very difficult to know. Sometimes it takes years, decades, mm -hmm. centuries, or millennia to ask these scientific questions before we ever sort of uh, uh, zero in on a, an acceptable explanation for something. The next example is that of Tim Noakes, a world-renowned scientist and doctor of sports medicine. He has written many books. I must confess that I've only read one of them and it reminds me that I should read some of his other ones. I haven't met Professor Noakes personally, but perhaps he'll come on my channel for an interview in the future to talk about challenging dogma and the persecution of doctors who speak out. From the little bit I know about him and what mutual friends have told me, he's a true scientist with a welcoming, open nature. One of Professor Noakes' major clashes with establishment dogma started in February 2014 when a mother sent a message over Twitter. Is LCHF, that's low carbohydrate, high fat, eating okay for breastfeeding mums? Worried about all the dairy and cauliflower equals win for babies. Noakes tweeted back that Baby doesn't eat the dairy and cauliflower, just very healthy, high fat breast milk, cares to wean baby onto LCHF. In other words, meat, fish, chicken, eggs, and dairy. And the result of this single tweet was a multi-million dollar legal case that extended over three years, described by many as Kafkaesque and the theater of the absurd. The problem started when South African dietitian Claire Jilsing Stridham reported Noakes to the Health Professions Council of South Africa because she disagreed with his Twitter comment. Now, we can only speculate as to the reasons that she made the complaint, but clearly she had one outcome in mind, and that was to silence Noakes and get him in trouble. Noakes is known for his opposition to South Africa's industry-led, high-carb, low-fat, food-based dietary guidelines, and we know that questioning any industry-led narratives can upset people. Look no further than many mainstream doctors who think the road to health is through the narratives pushed by the pharmaceutical industrial complex. Now, I'm not going to get into a discussion about what the best diet is because that's an individual's choice and has considerations beyond medical science. Let's be honest, the study of our diet is incredibly complex and nobody could claim that they have worked it all out. What is important is that many people have found Tim Noakes' low-carb, high-fat diet works beautifully for them and that's why they buy his books and support his work. And for those who realise the current epidemic of type 2 diabetes is likely to be a dietary disease, questions do need to be raised about the industry-pushed diet. But despite his important contributions in our insane world of scientific censorship, the South African Health Authorities tried to charge Noakes with professional misconduct, alleging all sorts of things, including practicing outside his expertise. Unfortunately for the authorities, the whole thing was a PR disaster, as despite their desperate attempts to prosecute him, he was eventually fully exonerated. Tim Noakes' case has special interest for me, as the Medical Council of New Zealand are trying similar things against me. Firstly, they have alleged that the videos I produce constitute the practice of medicine, and now that I have elected to leave clinical practice, that I may be charged with practicing without a license. As you know, I don't give medical advice to any of you. I simply perform an analysis of the evidence I find and give an opinion on what that means to me. What seems to distress my detractors and the medical authorities is that more and more people want to follow my work of their own volition. For me, the path is now so clear. It's liberating being out of a dogmatic system and pursuing science in an unshackled way. 
Don't get me wrong, my 16 years of clinical practice has provided me with invaluable insights into health, including dealing with real people face to face. But in this new phase I've entered, I believe I can bring about a much greater contribution to health and healing. As David Raznay points out, governments and their allies worked out that they were losing control of scientific debates and beginning in the 1980s commenced the practice of settling the science via press conferences. In this example, he talks about how the HIV narrative was dictated by the US government. Uh, so then they, uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services rapidly or uh, hastily put together a press conference on April 23rd, 1984. And at that press conference, this is what uh, uh, U.S. policy became at that press conference. AIDS was contagious, sexually transmitted, caused by uh, ultimately a retrovirus that Robert Gallo was going to talk about, started in Africa, and was 100% fatal. New Zealanders have been saturated with regular COVID press conferences from the likes of Jacinda Ardern and Ashley Bloomfield. Many of us were thinking of the word to describe this repetitive nonsense, but then someone came right out and admitted it was a full two week period of sustained propaganda. Like many countries, we have government approved individuals who are portrayed to the public as top scientists by state funded media. Some don't seem to realize that they are useful puppets being used to push political policies and fear. Yes, it is really quite frightening what's happening, but they have to realize that all our tourists are dying overseas. Um, the world is on fire and I don't think people realize that. We just want, we need you to listen to us and we need you to act when we ask you to act. I'm not convinced that their work would survive outside of their taxpayer funded jobs, but at least we can enjoy the comical attempts being made to convince the public to believe in them. Gosh, you've seen a lot of these three uh, over the past year, and we wanted to celebrate them and congratulate them and thank them this morning. Beaming in from Wellington uh, and our studio today is a triple whammy uh, from Screen Left, Michael Baker, Susie Wiles and Sean Hendy, looking like the backseat of a particularly cool bus. <laughs> <laughs> the second issue with health authorities and their acolytes is their new buzzword, misinformation. This seems to be an attempt to obstruct different points of view or a lazy tactic to undermine others without discussing the actual material. Last year, the Medical Council alleged I may be spreading COVID-19 misinformation, but when challenged to specify what this was, they were unable to do so. Because they can't produce their own content, no doubt they're cooking up something else against me. But don't worry, I'm ready. Additionally, in one letter, the Medical Council were concerned about the health literacy of my audience. Yes, they think you guys are clueless and want your attention laser focused on the officially sanctioned public health bureaucrats. Think about whether you need to do online shopping this week. Think about whether you need to do online shopping this week. Like many tech platforms and government agencies, their attempts to suppress ideas are futile and are mere speed bumps. I have connected with free thinkers from around the world, such as Annie Kaufman, Tom Cowan, my Virus Mania co-authors, as well as numerous podcasters and groups that are curious enough to do their own research. They are the most amazing human beings to engage with, and I'm always learning something new. And what I love is that, like me, threats by authorities and smear articles don't faze them in the least. They have gone beyond fear and will continue to pursue science, keeping in mind what the word actually means and understanding there is a higher purpose. While the authorities and their supporters remain in an illusory world, creating fear and division, we can be reminded of the words of Sri Chimnoy as we become fearless and bring light to our journey. Insecurity is a poisonous disease. Fear is worse. He fears others, he fears the unknown, he fears the vast. Finally, he becomes afraid of himself at every moment. He is afraid of his own possessions, not to speak of others' achievements or realities. To help sustain my channel in this time of censorship, please support my work on Subscribestar. Link is in the description. So that we don't lose touch, please find me at drsambailey.com and sign up for my free newsletter.